This game is for real ones only. It has skeletons and demons and blood and vampires and existentialism. You know, as the least famous of the video games released by the Hopu Pros, I always thought that Deadbolt was a little bit underappreciated by folks, assumedly because this one doesn't have you committing planetary genocide. With that being said, it's still a great experience. You play as John Dudebolt, super secret hitman assassin of the IRS, as he tracks down and kills zombies that snort cat litter to get high. But things get a little bit spookier when you realize that there's more to what's going on here than initially seen. But that's probably not the case, so we're just gonna shoot all these guys because it's cool and how to progress the game. So off the bat, whoa, look dude, you're stabbing the zombies, awesome. I'm gonna skip the next 30 seconds as there isn't any murder going on. YouTube told me that only 46% of the people that clicked on my most popular video watched past the first 30 seconds, so I'm trying to cram as much content into the first bit as possible. I don't think that matters though, since we're already 50 seconds in. I, I promise that when I'm more established, I'll have the cash to buy a DVD of the first season of Family Guy that I can rip and then leave in the bottom corner of the screen. I don't have that right now, so I'll just put this video of a cat I have here instead. You're not told much at the beginning of Deadbolt. It leaves a lot for you to wonder. Why am I a skeleton? Why is my house full of boxes? Why does my fireplace tell me to kill people? Well, the answer is pretty simple. You're not any skeleton. You're the Grim Reaper, or at least a Reaper. You've been summoned to quell an uprising comprised of the undead and other paranormal agents. However, Deadbolt is superior to a lot of pieces of media covering the paranormal. There will be no laser shooter thingies, no ghost busting here, not at all. No silver steaks or garlic either, nothing of the sort. You just shoot them. And for the first portion of the game, you'll be doing just that. It isn't until a few minutes in that you find a lead. The zombies are getting high. So, one thing that's pretty helpful is your ability to purchase new weapons from... Karan. I've been saving up a bit since this next level is pretty difficult if you don't have one. Got a decent selection of things to buy, 10 larger weapons to take into levels as your primary, and 5 smaller items to take as backup. We'll skip straight past the boring ones and buy what I consider the best primary, Twin Revolver's Death and Taxes. After that, your objective is to follow a lead you found at one of the previous locations, a small-time ash dealer named... Puff. I guess it makes sense as a nickname. But I have a better nickname! Dead. Because... Oh, may maybe Perv. Because he keeps a drawing of a naked vampire in his desk and that's not funny either. He keeps a Tommy gun in the basement for you to use since nobody else seems to know how to use it. Uh, so that's quite thoughtful. Each enemy type only has one weapon. The standard zombies have pistols, the thugs have metal pipes, the bouncers have sawn off shotguns, and the hellhounds have pitbull tendencies. You see, this game gets compared a lot to Hollow Miami, but this game has class. You go to your hideout in Deadbolt and the music is like this. Instead of that stoner music that's playing in Jacket's apartment 24-7. You use revolvers instead of walking in barehanded as your sophisticated killer. And the fat enemies in this game aren't even called fat enemies at all. They're called bouncers. It's much more respectful, really. Look, the Reaper even knocks on the front door before massacring everyone inside the building. This is even reflected in the game's cover art as we can see the Reaper politely waiting to be let inside the front door. At this point, the developers decide to start switching up the formula a bit. Zombie killing, while fun, can get a bit repetitive at times if nothing changes. Looking at you, Left 4 Dead fans. For the next mission, you're given a silenced pistol to start with and are asked to not kill all the enemies, but rather to find information from a candle that has been killed. Oh yeah, there are sentient candles in this game. They, they work with you under the same guidance of the fireplace. Don't think about it too much. It's kind of weird and confusing. The candle has a note that effectively tells you to go to another building and murder even more people. But now there's a twist. Their heads are missing. Nope, never mind. Sorry, I found them. They've just misplaced them across the room. This is still interesting, though, as it means they can spot you from locations that their bodies aren't present in. Luckily, shooting their heads instantly kills both their parts. The majority of this level's difficulty comes from the lock that you have to pick 20 times before opening the safe. Once you're done, the safe contains, shockingly, another address! This time to a warehouse full of ash, the drug the zombies are manufacturing, this time guarded both by zombies and vampires. Vampires are kinda neat, they're tall, pale, and full of exaggerated white boy swagger, so I can definitely relate to them in that sense. Also, like me, they stand upside down on the ceiling and shoot people at random. 
Story-wise, vampires are created after betrayal from a lover, as opposed to zombies that are created from unfinished business. They also have some sick-ass club music playing 24-7, probably much to the dismay of their neighbors. But probably not, since all their neighbors are also vampires. The rest of this mission plays out pretty similar to the rest. Burn all the ash, kill all the undead, and make your way out with more information. For the closing mission of the first third of the game, you're tasked with killing the leader of the Zombie Kings, the gang that you've been fighting against so far. The fireplace makes it clear that you only need to kill Roland, the leader, and not the rest of the zombies. So I do just that. He has a big character moment when you shoot him- <laughs> I'm just kidding, you shoot his face off and then walk out the building. So, having killed the leader of the zombie gang, the fireplace says, Cool, now go to this random club of vampires I found and kill them, and also they might have some vague information we can use as justification for another massacre. As the game mentions, dancing vampires won't notice you unless you attack them, so make sure to watch where you fire if you don't want to turn a dance mob into a mob mob. Anyways, in this one you also open a safe, sift through their stuff, and then leave. The next mission has you killing more vampires, but wait! You're supposed to only kill a few select vampires! Never mind. To be fair, the mission description pretty much just says kill a lot of vampires, but you really have to wonder why we need to thin out their numbers if the majority of them are just grooving around. Thankfully, they keep a sledgehammer present on the dance floor for some reason. It is actually pretty neat to see a joke slash easter egg about the party sledgehammer tradition. It makes sense since Hopu were based in the Seattle, or at least were in some point, and I live kinda close to there. I guess it's just a northwest thing as I haven't seen it anywhere else. For this next stage, I bought a different revolver since this level is a bit too large for death and taxes to be affected. You're introduced to a new enemy type this level, and by introduced I mean there are a bunch of them and you'll either learn how to not keep getting killed by them, or you'll stop playing the game. To stop bartenders from reviving, you need to shoot their associated bottles. The bottles are all very close in this level, presumably to make the introduction to the enemy type a bit simpler. Anyways, in the next level they do the exact opposite and place the bottles at the end of a very linear, dangerous path that's extremely hard to traverse. I've never talked to anyone else about this game, nor have I observed any other people talking about it, but my guess is that this is one of the more disliked and or notorious levels. I remember it taking me a long time to figure out on my first attempt, especially when I didn't know what weapon to bring. And honestly, I feel like, more than anything else, Deadbolt is a puzzle game. While you're still expected to aim well and take cover, most of playing well is knowing the right route and what weapons to use, along with the order you should take out the enemies in. The next level takes place at a... sleepover... party, being hosted in dual buildings. This level's gimmick is the two sisters who are connected to each other, meaning that you'll need to kill both of them within 10 seconds. This is made easier by the vents connecting the two rooms. At least they tried to block them off to make it harder, but there are levers right next to them that open them up anyways. I don't get why they didn't just drag an armchair or something in front of them. Even then, they probably could have had one of the bouncers do it. Arr. Anyways, now we need to investigate a club that's gone quiet. I don't really know why it's such a big deal considering these places are getting lit up every other night. Anyways, turns out there is actually something going on. The vampires are getting turned into drugs. There's another new enemy type that I hate, mostly because I really dislike the weapon they drop. The level's not too bad, but then you get a bunch of backup, which isn't that big of a deal on its own. But then a second wave of backup shows up, this time with even more vampires. And then you kill them all, and then there's a third wave of backup. It's also quite large. Now, unlike Hotline Miami, not all enemies drop guns, only the special types do. Ammo conservation and smart usage of melee weapons play a central role in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of Deadbolt. You can't just spray and pray into every room you walk in as you'll end up with a bunch of emptied guns and a lot of people chasing after you because of all the noise you made. Warning. The next portion of this video contains very spooky skeletons. You have been warned. Okay, now this is where things get spooky. I hope you put on a diaper this morning or are currently sitting on a toilet because you are about to piss and or shit yourself in fear when you see just how many bony boys are in this next part of the game. This level's actually not too difficult as the skeletons have done most of the killing for you, including the big boss guy you came to this building to look for. Also, here's a fun fact, if you're playing the game on low violence mode, first off, coward, second, Sir Stella isn't actually killed and he just sits there and chills out while you go and loot his safe and massacre everyone in this penthouse for the second time today. At this point, everything you know is a lie. The vampires are just chilling, the skeletons are murdering everyone, and the zombies have been snorting up people for the past two months. Now, in another shocking twist of fate, we have to save the vampires from being turned into drugs. None of them seem to mind those, they're all just having a rave anyways. Now, this level is another one I assume is ingrained in the memory of every single person that remembers playing this game. 
I knew exactly what to do and where to go, and it still took me around 10 minutes to beat it with the best weapons for the level. I finally found a good route, took out all the objectives, and- WHAT?! WHAT?! That's another feature of this level. After you stop the harvest, a dozen or so of the skeleton generals run in the building, backed up by even more gunners. The solution isn't too difficult, just don't light the first ash totem on fire until you're running out after getting the rest. You can even watch all of them pull up in their cars right next to you as you walk out the building. Bet they feel pretty stupid right now. For the final assignment against the vampires, the newly widowed Madame Stella is supposed to be killed. Much like someone in my extended family circle that I will not name, she has bad taste in coats and her house is just full of empty wine bottles. Except her soul is spread out between all of them, meaning that A, she has a good reason to have all of them, and B, you'll need to go full unsupervised three-year-old in the wine aisle mode on her collection. She's still not too much of a challenge. Now, here's a question for you. Would you rather go to the docks and have a cargo ship full of angry skeletons pull up, or be at the airport when a plane lands and hundreds of skeletons walk out? I hope you chose the docks option, because that's the only one of those two scenarios that the game will actually make come true. Virtually, at least. This is one of my favorite levels. It's not like it's incredibly memorable or unique, but I dig the atmosphere of hiding in the shadows as you make your way to and from the containers on the far ends of the area. Now, the next level, I actually have a bit of a vendetta against. To me, this level always felt like the we are trying to annoy you level. It's the scum level, the filth level, the level that introduces quite possibly the most annoying enemy type in the game. Technicians. Technicians plant mines on the ground when they get startled or hear a noise. They will then keep periodically placing down mines until they die. In a 2D game, with no jump button, and limited ammo that prevents you from shooting them. You know what else is great? When they place mines down right in front of the staircase is effectively blocking you from taking that route, sometimes even making it necessary to restart the level. Sometimes you have the ammo to shoot the mines. Well, guess what? Dead enemies have hitboxes, so if you kill a technician near one of their mines, sorry, bub, all your bullets are going into the dead guy and the mine's still gonna be there on the floor long after you've ran out of ammo. After that, they just tell you to go into a bar and kill some skeletons. There isn't even really any plot relevance either. Just like, yeah, we need a level to introduce the new skeleton enemy type. It's a fun level, notable for having two screens instead of one. It's also the opposite of a difficulty spike after the last level, like a, like a difficulty sinkhole. The next level sees us directly back on the lead we were given a few levels ago, this time to a relatively uninteresting warehouse with some drug paraphernalia in it and a few cargo crates on top. Now, let's play a game. You're opening up a package of yours in front of all your friends and family at a massive party. Which of these do you least want the package to have in it? A. $5,000 worth of VTuber merchandise. B. Your creepy Uncle Irwin's DVD collection. C. 100 rats with the plague. Or D. Dozens of mutilated corpses. If you said dozens of mutilated corpses, congrats! Your nightmare scenario is now reality. Anyways, try not too hard to think about that, as we need you to go to this dingy ass house full of shotguns set up to shoot you when you walk through doorways and improvise explosive traps. Luckily, I've played this game before, so I know my way out. Here, wanna see a cool trick? There's this really lame bit where you're supposed to go into this dark room and look for the light switch that kills the other guy instead of blowing you up. But if you brought the right gun with you, you can just blow them up from below the first floor. Sorry, kiddo. Maybe you should have built yourself floors as thick as your brainless dead skull. Okay, that was a bit rude. I, I can kind of relate to Timur as someone constantly afraid his government will kill him that also spends most of his time twiddling his thumbs at his desk. At this point, things aren't going too well for the skeletons. To try and make things better for themselves, they pay some demons to service hired guns for the really important sole purpose of defending their boss's car while it's getting serviced at some random place downtown. Everyone makes these demons out to be some sort of big threat when they're really just skeletons with more accurate rifles. This doesn't even do much against you since either you're dead or you're not after getting shot at. It's not like these guys make you more deader than all the guns the skeletons have. However, this makes the burst rifle a lot more dangerous against enemies when it's in your hands, due to how far you can hit people with it from. The level's pretty straightforward, you make it to the car and oh no, it's a guy with a minigun and he's dead already. Unsurprisingly, there's a very convenient note left on the card detailing exactly where it's supposed to be taken to.
Now, for the moment the game has been building up to since the key features section of the store page. Unlock and obtain over 30 weapons, ranging from a Reaper's Scythe to an Automatic Grenade Launcher. Grenade Launcher. Automatic Grenade Launcher. Grenade Launcher. Grenade Launcher. Grenade Launcher. Alright, hope you had your fun just then, because that's all you're ever going to see of it. If you're really careful, you can bring a few grenades to the second floor. There isn't much room to be smart with them, as this is one of the tallest levels in the game, and also one of the most linear. Just grab all the good weapons the enemies drop, hide in the shadows, or further than they can shoot you from, or just throw all the knives at them until you make it to the top. Seemingly fully aware of the fact that you'd make it to his apartment, Ibzan leaves a note effectively saying, Wow, I bet you feel really accomplished having made it all the way over here. We're building this awesome portal and getting the hell out of this lame-ass city. Don't even think about trying to stop us from doing this in the abandoned school auditorium, especially since we have our best sniper helping us. This note tells us that A. They are building a portal. B. They are all located inside an old school auditorium. And C. They have a sniper helping them. Unfortunately for their sniper, she seems to be pretty far from the building we're currently in, judging by the fact that her bullets take around 3 or so seconds to get here. Every sniper worth their salt knows you need to make sure your connection to the server is good before queuing for a competitive match. So to nobody's surprise, Val gets hard scoped and loses the 1v1 within a matter of seconds, ending up as another soul destined to never make it out of bronze. And now we're a bit late, as the portal has already been activated and people are running through it as we arrive. The candles have provided sniper support, but I just use it to kill this one big guy and then to take out the stragglers as I make it closer to the portal. Now, without further ado... This section does so much for the game despite only being a few minutes in length. The atmosphere, the story implications, the way it parallels the protagonist's story against the stories of those you've killed and those that you're fighting against. The fight against Ibzan is easily the best part of the game, in my opinion. The music, the setting, the way it's structured, all these serve to make it feel like a duel between two equals. It greatly adds to the theme of fighting a former ally of yours in an unfortunate future that came to be. You spend the entire game fighting against relatively non-threatening or clueless enemies, so having to play cat and mouse inside this mansion, scrambling to find more revolvers you can use against your attacker flips everything upside down, where suddenly your enemy is not just a faceless horde, but a single, deadly adversary. Deadbolt is a very well-designed game. The different factions are unique in function and make for good variety, there are a decent amount of weapons, but not too many to the point where they feel redundant, the levels are varied and new objectives and gimmicks are used to keep things from getting stale, coupled with a constant stream of new mechanics added throughout the game. Deadbolt is a great length, as well. It's not small to the point where it feels underwhelming, and it's not drawn out to the point where it feels tedious. It's a perfect length for what the gameplay is. But what really caught me off guard the first time I played it is that the narrative is actually extremely well done. It lulls you in by seeming irreverent, almost comical, and shoving the gameplay in your face. You explode zombies by materializing out of toilets, you punch them off roofs, almost like an overly cheesy action film. But the more you play, the more you learn about the world around you. You find out the motives your targets have, why they're doing the things they do in the first place. Humanizing the faceless enemies you kill over the course of the game isn't a new concept, but I find that the way it's featured in Deadbolt is done especially well. Every note you read, every tape you listen to, every person you meet, they all just paint a different picture of the events that play out over the course of the game. One where everyone else is just looking for the same warmth that you have. But if warmth is all there is... Why do I feel so empty after everything I've just been through? 